around Europe over what Muslim women should or should not wear has been seized on by a German right-wing party member for a political stunt. In fact, she turned up at a local parliament session in a burqa with her face and body fully covered. Once she arrived in the chamber, she was told to remove her veil before addressing parliament. She told us a bit more about this stunt and why she did it. The idea behind the experiment was to demonstrate what effect a niqab or burqa has. First of all, I aim to show that a woman covered with a piece of material is faceless, and due to this, she is not able to reveal her identity. She does not communicate with others face to face. This is just humiliating, and I think my experiment succeeded. I'd like to underline that the ruling CDU party talks a lot and acts very little. They are able to ban a full bill cover, but they don't. And our target is to ban it. That's why we drafted a bill in our regional parliament. The alternative for Germany party, known as AFD, has been increasingly making a name for itself of late, despite being labelled nationalist, populist and anti-immigrant. It was criticised for being Islamophobic after its manifesto called for a ban on face veils, minarets and public prayers for Muslims. The AFD has also been called authoritarian and crazed by some of Germany's top politicians. But name-calling aside, the AFD has steadily gained popularity since its foundation just three years ago. One poll now has shown that it could even overtake Chancellor Angela Merkel's CDU party in her home state in a regional election due tomorrow. Locals have been explaining why Merkel's party has been losing ground. I and a lot of other people found it overwhelming that an uncontrolled number of refugees came into our country. What seemed an easy task to handle is now a more difficult one, but the Chancellor is still saying that we'll manage it. The migration policy is not right, and that will have an influence on the decision I will make on Sunday. Leaders and VIPs from a host of Eastern nations are in Vladivostok right now. We'll bring up speed on that. And as you can see on your screen as well, President Putin just arrived in China for the forthcoming G20s. So a lot to come. Hope you can stay with me. I'm Kevin Owen. You're with RT International. Boombox, and these are the stories we are tracking for you today. I think that the euro is severely undervalued. That's the highest output in over three years. What the Fed really wants is inflation. The U.S. has more than doubled imports from Iraq. All that debt that was accumulated, they have to pay it off. And when you see oil go down, our economy goes down. What do you make of that data, and what does it really mean for the average worker? Just because bankers pay dividends on the money they stole doesn't mean that they didn't steal the money. Just because they pay themselves huge salaries and the Times of London will have the Fortune 100 list here in the UK and here are some big bankers. That doesn't mean they didn't commit crimes, right? Uh, you know, I bet they never mentioned that in the article. By the way, these, they should have an asterisk. Criminal, 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 criminal. <laughs> Okay, taking it to this live news event, we just saw the pictures of uh, President Putin's official plane landing there in China. He is there along with the other leaders just arrived for the G20 summit in China. The, uh, uh, 11th G20 summit getting underway on September the 4th. It's the first to be held in the country. China's done everything possible to make sure the eastern city of Hangzhou, that's where he is, sparkles for the arrival of these world leaders. You can see, you can see live pictures here. Uh, plenty of leaders going to arrive there. Um, President Obama got there earlier. Of course, the big news that's come out today, the U.S. and China have together responsible, it must be said, for 40% of the world's carbon emissions have uh, both ratified that Paris Global Climate Agreement. That was big news to come out from that, but they've got a lot to talk about. President Putin getting in the official limousine. And he is guest of honor there, has a good relationship uh, with the uh, Chinese uh, President Xi Jinping. And it seems that uh, top, one of the seats at the top table has been uh, uh, put aside for him. Representatives from Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, the list goes on. Also, of course, uh, the UK as well. Theresa May, she's going to be there. And also Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the president of Turkey. It's thought there's going to be uh, quite a long meeting between President Putin and uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan behind uh, closed doors later.
So a lot to cover there. We'll be across that over the next uh, two days. But as you can see, that official Russia plane and the limousine driving off. President Putin now, after leaving Vladivostok in the far east of Russia, is now there for that G20. We'll keep you posted. Now, ahead of the event, the city was given a multi-billion dollar makeover. People in one uh, rundown area were even urged to, uh, I'm quoting here, wipe out flies, cockroaches, mosquitoes and rodents from the streets. <laughs> All the uh, city's factories have been shut down to minimise pollution and keep the sky clear. Still looked a bit smoggy, though, didn't it? Local schools have been given an extended holiday, and families have even been given some holiday vouchers. So if they want to, they can leave that city to ease the congestion. It's a nice smiley welcome, and that was the official uh, promo video for the summit. But despite all the optimism surrounding that event in China and the smiles, tensions are high between some of the leaders attending that G20. Some of the uh, most anticipated meetings, as I mentioned just now, are going to be with the Turkish president. Recep Erdogan's already in Hangzhou. He was warmly welcomed uh, by the Chinese leader in a joint conference a bit earlier. Also, the presidents of the U.S., as you've just seen, Russia are there now, and they're due to meet Erdogan at some point later on today. Wrapping up what we know so far a correspondence there. This is Daniel Hawkins now. President Erdogan is one of the first foreign leaders Putin will be meeting here in Hangzhou at G20. This follows a nine-month freeze in relations between the two countries following the downing of that Russian jet last year on the Syrian-Turkish border. Uh, Erdogan subsequently apologized for that incident and in return received Putin's support in the wake of that attempted coup in Turkey. Now Erdogan has proposed that, uh, I, uh, that uh, Russia and Turkey fight ISIL together in Syria. This, of course, comes in the wake of quite a tense relationship between Ankara, uh, Washington and uh, NATO. The Turkish president effectively giving Washington a ultimatum that they must choose between Turkey's allegiance and hosting in their country Fethullu Gulen, the Turkish opposition leader who, at least according to Turkish authorities, was behind the planning of that uh, attempted coup. There's been quite a lot of uh, accusations to and fro between the two. Ankara accusing Washington of a lack of cooperation. Washington accusing the Turks of targeting the Kurds in Syria rather than ISIL. Very much an interesting time here. All eyes will be uh, on that meeting with Erdogan and Putin. Uh, the U.S. nevertheless calling Turkey still one of its key allies in the region. So it remains to be seen here what the outcome of that meeting will be. Yeah, and the meeting uh, between the presidents of China and the U.S. is also highly anticipated. Both leaders have attended a ceremony with the U.N. secretary, formally signing their countries up, as I mentioned again just now. It's that Paris climate agreement. That's real big news today, which is aimed to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. But despite all the smiles and all the handshakes, there are still reasons for the countries to feel tense. As soon as he landed in China, uh, President Obama declared Beijing must avoid flexing its muscles in the South China Sea. Earlier this week, a former Air China employee was indicted for smuggling packages onto flights to from New York to China on behalf of Chinese officials. We asked a current affairs commentator from China Radio International about the timing of that sentence. I, I think it's more like a coincidence instead of a, a intentionally arranged a case here. There are problems, of course, uh, you know, especially when the U.S. launched this um, uh, strategic initiative uh, called you know, Paper to Asia a few years ago. You do see there are uh, increasing tensions, especially the U.S. military uh, maneuver. Uh, you can see they have increased the number of military bases in Asian countries, in the Philippines, in uh, Australia, and also uh, intensified in military presence in other countries, like uh, relations with Vietnam, uh, in Singapore. Uh, but the thing is, uh, you know, China is not seeking, say, a dominant position in Asia or in the world. So I think there's a misjudgment or strategic misjudgment from the U.S. side. Um, Elsewhere around the world this weekend, art's often supposed to be provocative, but if you're in Gaza, it can be positively dangerous. A 16-year-old artist called Mohammed found himself in deep trouble with the authorities for doing nothing more than painting a picture of a structure. Here's his story. <laughs> I saw him standing near the gate, surrounded by 20 policemen. 
They held this painting saying that it is a provocation. When the interrogator saw my painting, she said she didn't like it. I told her I didn't make it up. It's all taken from real life. We see it every day. Racist, let them remove it. The row over Apple's massive European tax bill that came out in the weeks escalating Ireland. Now they're trying to get the European Commission chiefs to reconsider it. The tech firm has been told to cough up a record 13 billion euro, which the EC said was owed to Ireland, accusing Dublin's tax authorities of being too generous towards Apple. Harry Fear has more on Ireland's move than and the Irish people's reaction to what's happened. Well, certainly something of a surprise for some in Dublin today. I can't imagine myself saying no to 13 billion euros, but that has been the decision taken by the Cabinet meeting today. And there have been vast calls to take the opposite route, the one that we now know that they have taken to appeal the European Commission's ruling decision. The money, of course, could have been spent, as many opponents of this uh, decision said, on housing, education and health care. And just to give you a measure of what 13 billion euros in back taxes could have bought, well, the current entire state health care budget is something like 13 billion euros. So something could have been done with the money, certainly, uh, plus interest from Apple. And there were, as I say, calls to do that, including petitioning the dumping of apples by demonstrators in protest. So why on earth would the Irish government say no to this opportunity? Well, there are apparently anxieties about scaring away international business. Ireland is seen to have at the moment a very lenient corporate tax climate, not wanting them to scare away jobs. It's thought something like one in ten jobs in the country are linked with the presence of multinationals in the country. So certainly a difficult, controversial decision to have been taken. No wonder then why they postponed doing it uh, for two days to mull over the different options. Yeah, a lot to think about. Harry Fear there. All our news, don't forget this weekend at your service all the time, not just at the weekend, throughout the week as well. RT.com 24 7. Thanks for being with us. Coming up, that's the Kaiser Report. Max and Stacey discussing that very Apple row next. Stay with us if you can. <laughs>